Hey folks, thanks for joining us for Coastal Online. My name is Aaron Sanders, I'm the lead pastor, and we really want to connect with you. And one of the ways you can do that is through our website, go to discovercoastal.org. Uh, you can also visit our, our app and download that on your phone. And then if you're watching on social media, there should be a link for you to click uh, and you can connect to us that way. But either way, we just wanna know that uh, you're watching with us and we wanna get to know you and know your story. Our mission is to help people know and follow Jesus. And we wanna be part of your faith journey. Now, if you have prayer requests, uh, this is also the place where you can do that. So uh, our, our staff and our prayer team pray for these requests every week. And so we wanna be able to lift up those things uh, on your behalf and uh, hope you, you won't hesitate. So thanks again for joining us and uh, we'll see you online. Well, if you have a Bible with you, go and open up to the book of Ephesians. Uh, we're going to be in kind of the second half of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22 this morning. And uh, as you're turning there, uh, today we come to the conclusion of our series entitled, His Name Shall Be. And uh, for the last three weeks, we've been walking through the different names of Jesus as shown to us in Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, as Isaiah prophesies about this coming Messiah... He says that there will be unto us a child who is born, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and then finally Prince of Peace. And today, as we gather together and we close out this series, what we're going to do is we're going to look at that last name that the prophet gives for this future Messiah, the name Prince of Peace. And in order for us to understand how Jesus truly is the Prince of Peace, we, we first need to understand what the Bible means when the Bible talks about peace. Okay, if we're going to understand who Jesus is as the Prince of Peace, we first have to get the full understanding of what the Bible means by the word peace. You see, when the Bible uses the term peace, there are really two definitions that come along with it. And both of these definitions need to be in place. Both of these aspects need to be present in order for true, genuine peace to occur. You see, to have just one of these aspects without the other is not to have true peace. To have true, genuine, biblical peace is for both of these things to occur. And when we look from a biblical perspective as to what peace really is, the first definition that we get when we get the word peace is the typical standard definition of peace that we will probably first think of when we think about peace. And it's this idea of the absence of hostility. That when it comes to peace, oftentimes when we hear about peace treaties or people making peace or whatever it might be, Usually the first thing that comes into our minds is this idea of the absence of war or the absence of hostility. And from a biblical perspective, this definition of peace is, is definitely present throughout the Bible. For, Second Chronicles chapter 14 says, He built fortified cities in Judah, for the land had rest. He had no war in those years, for the Lord gave him peace. Notice that as 2 Chronicles tells us about this peace that's being experienced here, that the definition that comes along with it is the absence of war. And so the very first basic underlying definition of what it means to have true peace is to have the absence of conflict, the absence of war, and the absence of hostility. And in our world today, as we think about peace and strive for peace, this is typically the kind of peace that we're striving for, isn't it? Right? It, it's the you do you mentality, right? You do you, I'll do me, and then we'll just kind of live in quote unquote harmony as we don't mess with each other, right? And so peace in our world is very much this lack of hostility, absence of hostility. That's what equals peace. But the Bible's definition of peace is far greater than that. That's just the starting place for biblical peace. 
You see, the, the Bible's definition goes way beyond that to not only describe the absence of hostility, but the presence of something even greater. You see, true, genuine peace from a biblical perspective is not just the absence of war, the absence of conflict, or the absence of hostility, but it's the presence of unity. It's the presence of wholeness. It's the presence of completion, of oneness. In the book of Job, Job says this, you shall know that your tent is at peace, and you shall inspect your fold and miss nothing. Notice the way that Job describes peace in this passage. The way that peace is described is that everything is complete. The reason why his tent is in a state of peace is because there's nothing that's missing. Everything is there. It's it's wholeness, completeness, it's oneness, it's unity that describes this peace. And so when the Bible talks about peace, this is the kind of peace that it's talking about. It's not only the absence of hostility, but it's also the presence of unity. And and so for two countries who are at war with each other to have genuine peace, not only must the war cease, but unity and reconciliation must be amended. It's not just the absence of that hostility or the absence of the threat of that hostility, but it's genuine unity and oneness in its place. That's what it means to have genuine peace. And so when the prophet Isaiah prophesies about a coming Messiah, a child who will be born unto us, and he says that his name shall be the Prince of Peace. This is the kind of peace that Isaiah has in his mind. The absence of hostility and the presence of unity. And so if that is genuine peace, And if that's what Isaiah is thinking about when he declares Jesus to be the Prince of Peace, the next question that we have to answer is, how is Jesus this kind of Prince of Peace? How does he bring this kind of peace? Not just the mere absence of hostility, but the presence of unity. And in order to see that, that's where we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. And So starting in verse 11, this is what it says. It says, Therefore remember... That at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Notice that how in the New Testament, when when they talk about Jesus in light of peace, that both the absence of hostility and the presence of unity is right here. I mean, look at verse 14 again. For he himself is our peace. How? Because he has made us both one. We are united together and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. The peace that Ephesians tells us that Jesus brings is this peace, this true peace, that is both the absence of hostility and the presence of unity. But in light of Ephesians 2... The way that Paul, the author of Ephesians, frames up this peace is predominantly between two hostile parties, the Gentiles and the Jews. You see, in the Old Testament, when the Old Testament authors would would talk about people groups or, or categories of people, if you will, they would often put them in one of two camps. You were either a Jew or an Israelite because you were a part of the nation of Israel. You were God's chosen people. Or... 
you are one of the other nations and you are a Gentile. And so that's how they broke it down. You were either a, a Jew in the nation of Israel or you were part of any other nation and therefore you were, de you were defined as a Gentile. It's like Harry Potter calling all non-wizards muggles, right? It's the exact same thing. We have all the Israelites and then we have all the muggles, right? We have, we have all the, the Gentiles. And for centuries, there was intense hostility between these two people groups. I mean, we can even see a glimpse of it here in Ephesians 2 when Paul says that the Gentiles were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. To be alienated from the commonwealth of Israel means that you're alienated from citizenship. They didn't want you to be a part of their country at all. They wanted nothing to do with you. William Barclay, Barclay, in his commentary on the book of Ephesians, describes the hostility like this. He writes, The Jew had an immense contempt for the Gentile. The Gentiles, said the Jews, were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell. Yikes. God, they said, loves only Israel of all the nations that he had made. The best of the serpents crush, they said. The best of the Gentiles kill. It was not even lawful to render help to a Gentile mother in her hour of sorest need, for that would simply be to bring another Gentile into the world. Until Christ came, the Gentiles were an object of contempt to the Jews. The barrier between them was absolute. If a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl, or if a Jewish girl married a Gentile boy, the funeral of that Jewish boy or girl was carried out. Such contact with a Gentile was, equivalent of, was the equivalent of death. That is intense hostility. That, that, if, that if a Jewish boy or girl were to marry a Gentile, that the parents would act as if they were dead. That they are dead to their parents. That is intense. And to some degree, man, I get that, right? Like if my kids grow up and they marry someone who loves cats, they'll be dead to me too. I hate cats, man. They are the worst. For starters, I'm allergic, so my eyes just constantly water. I'm around them. And two, at every moment, I am deathly afraid that they're just going to start clawing my eyes out. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, Chris, you just need to meet my cat. My cat is basically a dog. And I hate that comparison. Like, to be a good cat means to be a basic dog. Just get a dog. <laughs> but this hostility between the Gentiles and the Jews, man, it runs deep. I mean, it is centuries and generations long. It is deep, deep, deep hostility. It is personal. And it is deep. But notice what Ephesians says about their present reality. That even though there was centuries of hostility between these two people, that now there is peace. And the reason why there's peace is because the hostility has been removed and it has been replaced with unity. But notice how in light of Ephesians, how that unity comes. It's not just any unity. They didn't just join a club together and it's like, you know what? We can play Scrabble together. It's fine. The reason why there's unity here is because of Christ. It is their oneness in Christ that leads them to be one together. Don't miss this. The way that Paul writes this section of his letter is he describes it as this unity, this peace between Gentile and Jew only happens, only happens through the oneness and the unity in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Don't miss that. And man, like, how amazing is that? That Christ is able to bridge this centuries, generations of hostility and bring about this peace and unity. 
You see, the thing that we have to remember and know here is that the only people in the Jewish camp and the only people in the Gentile camp that are experiencing this kind of peace with each other are those who have put their faith in Jesus. If you're an unbelieving Jew, if you're an unbelieving Gentile in this moment, this peace is not for you. It's an alien kind of peace. It, you're, it's a foreign peace to you. You are not experiencing this peace. The only people in this situation who are experiencing this kind of peace through the, means of, through the midst of such hostility in their past are those who are one in Christ because they have put their faith in Christ. It's as if this unity in Christ leads to unity with others. And the reason why it's framed up that way is because that is the exact reality of the situation. It's as if the peace that the Gentiles and the Jews were experiencing is a direct result of an even greater peace. And there is a greater peace. You see, this hostility between the Gentiles and the Jews in Ephesians 2 is not the greatest hostility that we see in Ephesians 2. It's not the greatest hostility we see in the entire Bible. This hostility between these two camps is a shadow of the greatest hostility, and the greatest hostility that we see is the hostility between humanity and God. That's where great hostility lies. And the reason why there is deep hostility there has nothing to do with God. God is not hostile towards us. We, in our sinfulness, are hostile towards God. Isaiah chapter 59 says this, But your iniquities, your sins, have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Colossians chapter 1 says something similar. It says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Notice the similarity in language in comparison to Ephesians 2, right? That just like the Gentiles, we are separated from God because of our sins. That just like the Gentiles, we are alienated from Christ. Just like the Gentiles, we are hostile in our minds and in our thinking. If you go read the book of Romans, Paul describes humanity as enemies of God. You see, the greatest hostility that we see is not between Jew and Gentile. The greatest hostility that we see is between humanity and God himself. That's where the greatest hostility is found. And the only way for peace to be experienced in light of such hostility is if somehow, some way, our sins were removed, our hostility was removed. And in its place, we receive unity and oneness with God. And that is the greater peace that Jesus comes to bring. It is not just oneness and unity with each other. It is not just the mere absence of violence and war. The great peace that the Prince of Peace comes to give is the peace that we have with God the Father, that the hostility is removed and in its place we now have access to God because we are one with the Father. That is the peace that Jesus comes to bring. Keep reading in Ephesians 17. It says, And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being built, joined joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Notice what Paul says 
that when it comes to the hostility between us and God, our sinfulness that separates us from him, that now we have access to the Father. And the reason why we have access to the Father is because we have been made one with the Son. Your oneness to the Father, your access to God, that reconciliation, the peace that we now get to know and enjoy and experience with God the Father is only a reality because of your unity with the Son. Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace that Jesus comes to bring is a peace between humanity and God. And that peace between us bleeds out and leads to peace between each other. It is because we have unity with the Son that we now have unity with the Father. And genuine peace is not only the absence of hostility, it's the presence of unity. And so here's what Jesus does as the Prince of Peace. He removes our sin by dying on the cross and rising from the grave. He removes the hostility, but at the same time, he brings us into the fold of God and we are now united with the Father and are able to experience genuine peace with God because not only has the hostility been removed, but unity has taken its place. We are are one with the Father because we are one with the Son. Look at 1 Corinthians 6. It says, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. At the end of Jesus' ministry, in John 17, he prays a prayer over his disciples. It's famously called the, the high priestly prayer. And this is what he says in John 17, verses 21 through 23. He says, he prays, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them as you love me. Notice the beautiful language that Jesus uses in this prayer. That he is in the Father and the Father is in him and that we also in a similar way are in the Son and the Son is in us and that through all of this we commune in unity with both Son and Father. The reason why we have peace with God is because we have unity with the Son. Jesus brings perfect peace by abolishing hostility and putting unity in its place. And now we are one with him. And it is from that oneness with the Father, through the unity of the Son, that Jews and Gentiles are now one together. They are united together by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. This oneness in Christ leads to oneness with other believers. That is one of the blessings of being one in Christ. But here's the thing, that's not the only blessing of what it means to be one in Christ. Back up to the very beginning of the book of Ephesians. The very first thing that Paul says, Ephesians 1, 3, right after he gives his formal greeting. This is the very first thing that Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Notice the language that Paul uses as he opens up this letter. The first thing he does is he describes our relationship with Christ. He says that we are in Christ, right? Christ in me, I in Christ. We are in Christ, united together, one with him. And then as a result of that unity with Christ, 
he then declares that every spiritual blessing flows, every single one of them. And let me just say this, it is absolutely crucial and vital that we realize that every blessing that God gives flows out of unity in him. And the reason why that's so crucial and so important is because if we view the blessings, if we view our righteousness, our salvation, our justification, you name it, if we view those things as something we receive apart from Christ, we run the risk of delighting in the gift and not the giver. You see, the beauty of these blessings that Christ pours out into us is that we receive them not because he just gives them to us from a distance. We receive them because we are one in him. It is our unity in Christ and with Christ that we experience every spiritual blessing that we can possibly experience. Marcus Peter Johnson, who wrote a book called One with Christ, says it like this. He says, salvation cannot be abstracted from the person of Christ because salvation is Christ. It is the joining of our persons to his person. And so salvation cannot be objectified or thingified as if it were something Christ could give to us apart from himself. He offers himself to us because that is what it means to be saved. Your salvation is not something that Christ imputes upon you from a distance without union with you. Salvation is imputed to us because we are one with him. And so the reason why we are saved is because Christ is our salvation and we are one with Christ. The reason why we receive righteousness is because Christ is our righteousness and we are one with Christ. The reason why we stand victorious over sin and death is because Christ stands victorious over sin and death and we are one with him. Every spiritual blessing that flows out of Jesus comes to us by the means of unity. And that's what it means for Jesus to be the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, not because he simply removes hostility. Jesus is the Prince of Peace because in the place of hostility, he brings unity, and out of that unity, every spiritual blessing flows in abundance. You are saved because you are his. One month ago yesterday, my wife and I finally adopted all four of our kids. Here's a picture of our family. We've been a family for about two and a half years. I've not been able to show their picture from the stage. I've not been able to use their names from this stage because we put everything online. And so just to protect their identity and whatnot, we had to just say the oldest daughter or whatever. But now, here they are, right? On the far left is Maddie June Cummings. Right in the middle is Liam David Cummings. We have Braxton David Cummings. And on the far end is Bexley Kate Cummings. And one month ago yesterday, my wife and I walked into a courtroom, like we've done plenty of times with those kids. And man, I barely held it together. I think the only reason why I didn't just cry the entire time is because my oldest son, Liam, was just being incredibly distracting. Like he was just making me laugh the entire time where I just couldn't cry, you know? I was like, actually, thanks, bro. Like you did a good job. But we went into that courtroom as kids in our home. And we went out of that courtroom a united family. My kids moving forward from now, 
do not have to worry if one day they're going to have to move to another home and get another parents again. They experience that far too many times in their life. My kids don't have to come home from daycare and school and wonder if it's going to be safe at home. They don't have to worry about violence inside the home anymore. And the reason why is because they're ours. And those worries go away now that they're in our home. You see, before this moment, they were in our home, but now they're in our family. And there's a big difference. They're not just home. They are forever home now. They're in our family. And because they are in our family, they experience every blessing of what it means to be in our family. And so a week and a half after we adopted our kids, we wanted to celebrate. And the only way you can truly celebrate is by taking your kids to Disney World. And so we got on a plane with some of our extended relatives and we took a trip to Disney World. This is my favorite picture from that trip, mainly because of Maddie's face. That is awesome. And you know what? When we took them to Disney World, you know what we didn't do? We didn't tell them. We said, all right, hey, kids, only the good ones can come, right? Like, oh, sorry, you can't come. Like, you lied to me. You're going to have to stay at home by yourself with our dog, Bella, right? You know, they all came, regardless of previous behavior up until that point. We also didn't tell our kids, hey, you better save up because this church is expensive and you have to pay your own way. We didn't tell them that either. They all came and we paid thousands of dollars for all of them to come. Why? Because they're our kids. That's it. They receive the blessing of what it means to be in our family because they are in our family. And in a very similar and far more perfect reality, the same is true of you if you are in Christ. The peace that Jesus brings leads us to unity with the Father and every spiritual blessing that we can possibly know and experience comes out of that unity. You're saved not because he gives it to you apart from himself. You are saved because you're his. You are righteous because you're one with the son. You stand victorious because you are a part of the family of God. It is unity in, through Christ with the Father that we experience every spiritual blessing. It all flows out of that unity. And it's all possible only because Jesus is our Prince of Peace. We cannot reconcile our relationship with God. We are the ones who are causing the hostility but what Jesus does is he takes our hostility and he nails it to a cross. And by grace through faith in that Jesus, you can be made one with the Son and the Father. And from that, can experience every possible blessing. And so as we close this morning, here's where I want to leave you to simply enjoy the unity that you have with the Son. There is no greater joy and there is no greater relationship than that one. And so feed it. Feed your affections for Jesus. Delight in the unity that you have with the Son, knowing that through that unity, every spiritual blessing that you can possibly receive, you receive through Him. He is our Prince of peace because he removes the hostility he brings unity and from that unity every blessing flows let me pray Heavenly Father God we thank you for your son who makes a way for us to experience not only 
the blessings that you give, but true, genuine union with you. You are an amazing God. And Christ, God, we just come before you and we praise you and God, we thank you for not only removing the hostility, but bringing us into a place of unity. You, God, are holy and righteous and good. And God, we do nothing to deserve your love. But God, you give it and you give it freely. And so God, I I pray now, God, for the person in this room who doesn't know that union and doesn't know that peace. God, that you would stir in their heart, God, this affection for you. God, that you would show them, Lord, that, that you truly do remove the sin, that you remove the hostility, and God, that you bring us into relationship with God, into union with the Father. Holy Spirit, that you would grab our hearts this morning as we dwell on the perfect, beautiful reality that you are the Prince of Peace, and as a result, we are one with you. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's stand and worship him together. Well, wow, that was an incredible message, and I'm so glad that you could join us for it. Hey, listen, uh, we could not do what we do without your generosity. And so if you would like to give a donation to Coastal's ministry, you can do that through our website, discovercoastal.org. You can also do it through our app. Uh, You can click on the link that's here uh, on the social media link if you're watching uh, through Facebook. Uh, or you can even send us a check. We, we'll take that too. But uh, we really do appreciate the way you uh, help support what God is doing through Coastal Community Church. And we take that, that gift seriously uh, as we try to help people know and follow Jesus. Hey guys, have a great week and we'll see you soon.